All right, we are live. Thank you, everybody, for joining Bellwether Hub live yet again. We have another guest this week. Thrilled to have another guest this week. We've been bringing you fantastic guests in this wonderful month of December, and all of them are going to be highly valuable to you. Um, this one in particular, you know my feelings and my skepticism when we talk about uh, reading books for like mentorship and everything else, and, and how do you actually make that real? I have found someone who can help you make it real. And that's why I'm really excited about this guest. Um, we have Scott Jeffrey Miller, author of Master Mentors. I'm going to have him. He's got one too. That's great. I've got my notes in mind. Um, Scott is, uh, I'm going to have him introduce himself, but he's at Franklin Covey, um, major background in, in business, CMO, thought leadership, podcast host, book author. He's got all of the, um, what's great about him is he doesn't just have the, the criteria on his resume. He's got good company and he hangs out with really cool people. And these really cool people are the really special people and they have the really good ideas, which we're going to talk about in the book a little bit. But I'm mostly interested in his perspective as well on how we can actually find a mentor, what to look for in a good mentor, and how do you really interpret all of this information that you read in all of these books. Everybody, we got Christmas coming up. Everybody's getting a whole bunch of business books and everything on self-development and self-improvement. How do we actually make that real and turn it into to something fantastic? So with that, I'm turning it over. Welcome, Scott. Thank you so much for joining us on Bellwether Hub. Please introduce yourself and, and let's talk about you. Jim, thanks for the spotlight and the uh, platform. Delighted to be here. So I live in Salt Lake City, Utah, where there was a big snow dump this morning. So the resorts are ready to go. My wife, Stephanie, and I have three young boys that are seven, nine, and 11. And to her horror, they all have my personality. So there's a lot going on in the Miller house uh, most days. I'm from Florida originally, born and raised in Orlando, Florida. I worked for the Walt Disney Company for four years until they invited me to leave, which is another way to say they uh, kicked me out. So where does a single Catholic boy from Orlando move? Well, of course, to Provo, Utah, where all the Catholics are. So here I came out that was a joke, to Provo, Utah 26 years ago. I've had a 26-year career in what is the world's most influential leadership development company, Franklin Covey, founded, of course, by the incomparable author Stephen Covey of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, was the chief marketing officer for a decade. I now am privileged to host what is the world's largest weekly leadership podcast. It's about 7 million each Tuesday morning, where I am honored to interview some of the greatest minds in the world. I write a column for Inc. Magazine. I uh, write books pretty um, significantly. Uh, and, and I'm delighted today to talk about Master Mentors, which is based on some of my favorite guests from the first year of the podcast. Master Mentors is the first volume of 10 volumes from HarperCollins. I just finished Master Mentors Volume 2, highlighting 30 new people coming out in 2022. I'm passionate about mentorship and career growth. And so I'm delighted to take questions and talk about all things mentoring today. I love it. Thank you so much. So let's talk about, you know, 10 series, 10 part series is significant, yeah. right? But <laughs> it just goes to show uh, how many experts there are out there. Yeah. yeah. And how do you filter the noise and find the one that's right for you? Right. And because we're, we're inundated yeah. with information yeah. all the time. Yeah. yeah. The first 30, I can't wait to see what else you get in these next nine because they're your, better. Your, your group is legit. Seth Godin, Thanks. Daniel Pink, Karen Dillon, Susan David. I mean, these are Jay Papazon. These are names that any business person has their books. I mean, look right. at me. I've got my book, the books yeah. on my shelf too. Yeah. Um, who's your favorite from this first series? Yeah. I'm going to ask you that. And then I'm going to yeah. talk to you about, about filtering it through. It's like asking who my favorite kid is. That's right. It's and you oldest, have an answer. It's the oldest kid, by the way. Yeah, because he's so sweet. Typical first child. You know, you're right. I have been privileged, Jim, to have access to some of the greatest minds, whether they are Pulitzer Prize winning authors, four-star generals, best-selling business titans. Nick Vujicic is my favorite. He's number one. Nick Vujicic, of course, is the famous motivational author and writer. He is Australian by birth and Texan by choice. And he is like you and I in control of his mindset, but that's about all because he has no arms and no legs. He has a head and a neck and a torso and a groin and no hands, no feet, no arms, no legs. And I write about Nick as master mentor number one of being a model of gratitude, wanting what you have and not what you don't. He's really taught me the power 
of living life through the lens of not I have to or I ought to, but rather I get to. I get to take the garbage out tonight at 11 p.m. I get to scrape my wife's car at 6.30 this morning to get it heated up for school. I get to have a high courage conversation with an employee. I get to terminate someone because I get to release them from the pain that is the wrong fit. A transformational insight around being grateful for even the burdensome tasks in life. Nick cannot take out the garbage. Get, Nick cannot scrape his wife's windshield at five in the morning. And so I think the first mentor, Nick Vujicic, will transform your life when you read this chapter about just being grateful for being able to take a glass of water and a drink and scratch your head. Nick cannot do these things, yet he is able to control his outlook and his mindset and live an amazing life while most of us, all of us, typically take for granted our fingers each day being able to type and eat and drink and save ourselves from an emergency. Nick cannot do any of that. Yeah, which is, uh, it's an amazing just for for perspective shift and amazing for, um, you know, we're overwhelmed. A lot of people are overwhelmed, especially with the pandemic and the amount of work we have to do and all of these types of things and, and taking that step back. Uh, from a gratitude perspective is, is uh, fundamental. Um, it changes I, your life when you lead every decision, every activity through the lens of, I get to do this. I get to stop and get gas and put $78 of gas in my car yesterday. And it, it changes your, it changes your life. But it's also like, if you see Nick speak, yeah. it's like, it's mind blowing yes. the, the way that he does it. It's amazing how captivating he is. Yes. Um, how so that's a perfect example for making this real right we can look up nick and we can watch his videos uh we can listen to the podcast we can read the book uh on nick at the end of the day right saying i'm grateful i get to spend 80 dollars filling up my gas tank is you know it's tough how do you how do you talk to your people about uh because you've got a business background too you've led teams at, at frank lecovey you've yeah. done all of this how do you get them to interpret this in their own way because for us to change and adopt real tangible, you know, gratefulness and, and you know, the Stephanie McMahon one on branding and, and being present in the moment and all this, all of these are really impactful things, difficult to do all at once. It is. How do you, do you just focus on one? Do you, yeah. what's your presence exercise? How do you, how do you teach people to do that? It's a, it's a very timely question. When I wrote this book, my favorite publisher who published many books behind me, they actually passed on it because they said, you know what? It's too episodic. It's kind of here and there. There's no red thread. And I said, that's it is I want this book to hit people where they are. I'm very aware of the idea of your smallest viable market. Seth Godin hammers it over my head whenever we talk. But this was a book that I think really, Jim, meets people where they are, whether you are an entrepreneur, whether you've just declared bankruptcy, whether you've just been divorced or promoted, or you've lost someone in the pandemic or you're going through a great or difficult time in your life. I wrote this book intentionally episodic to bring access to some of these greatest minds across 30 really disparate areas of genius, of transformational insights. Not everything will hit everyone the same way. But I tell you, I picked 30 of them that I thought would hit a lot of people similarly. You know, you recognize that everyone's on a different journey in life. And I think there's debate about that. But People that work for me all have different values and different needs and wants and desires. And so the book is to start anywhere, go everywhere. Light, easy, breezy, you know, a thousand words a chapter. You can read a chapter in six or seven minutes. You can, you know, glance at the back and figure out which one works best for you. But my sense is if you read one, you'll start to read another one, another one, another one, as readers now say, because I wrote it kind of like chicken soup for the leadership soul. Very fast and episodic. One chapter might be about brain health. The next one's on messaging. Another one that is on introverts versus extroverts, fearless versus recklessness. So I'm quite proud of its episodic nature. It sold extremely well. And I think I hit a bit of a nerve where people are busy. No one has time to read right. a 300 word, 300,000 word book or a 300 page book anymore. This is the kind of book you can pick up and read it in a moment, plane ride, put it in a stocking and have, you know, your 18 year old son or your 70 year old grandfather read it and enjoy it. And each chapter has not just the key transformational insight, but a pithy, provocative question that I ask. So like, now what? What are you going to do about this? And how are you going to put it to play in your life? And I like how, you know, being episodic and you can pick your, your different types. You've got some that require a little more thought, like the brand yeah. stuff. Yeah. 
but then I love the the Daniel Pink on the circadian rhythm and and yeah. how do you actually just structure your day all of a sudden? Yeah. Yes. Which you can actually start the next day. But you also with these, you got the have cards. cards. Um, tell me about the cards because is this meant to be? Yeah. So uh, what you're showing are my version of PowerPoint. I don't use PowerPoint. I stopped using PowerPoint 12 years oh, ago man. when I actually did not have the dongle that is required to actually open your keynote presentation on Apple. So I got up in front of a presentation and delivered a seven hour event with no slides. And I cured myself from it because I just think when you have slides, you are enslaved and you have a crutch and you present to your slides versus your audience. So I stopped using slides more than 12 years ago. When I present, I have a card deck, like a literally physical card deck. This is the deck that is, um, I give it every keynote speech. Uh, it is my version of PowerPoint. It's tactile. It's useful. It allows someone to keep it with them after the presentation because when the PowerPoint goes down, so does your content. So yep. I create card decks for every book that I write and use them in all my keynotes. People can buy them on the website or use them, you know, after I give a keynote speech. But I like to feature each of the authors. Here's, you know, Jay Papazan you mentioned with the insight. The back is the transformational insight and a QR code that takes you right to the video and audio edition of the podcast in case you want to listen to the whole interview with the person. The criteria of being in the book was that you were a guest on the podcast. So thanks for referencing the cards. They're independent of the book, but you can visit my website and learn how to get copies of the cards. No, I love it. So as we talk to, um, let's talk about most of the people who listen to this podcast, you know, which we've talked about, we've got um, a lot in the financial industry, a lot of business people were really merging like personal capability mm -hmm. and, and business goals, right? And when we talk about the new economy, we talk about finding mentorship and setting up programs within the organization. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, you know, you've got your high potential people and we, we put them up and they get coaching and everything, but there's a broader audience that really, you know, as I coach people, their biggest frustration is I don't have a mentor. Yes. How do you look for a mentor? Yeah. You know, yeah. we'd all love Daniel Pink to be our mentor. We'd all yeah. love Scott yeah. Miller to be our, our, yeah. our mentor. How do you if find only. a mentor to, to push you up and, and uh, really get involved or invested into your individual development? Sure. I'm actually writing a book on mentoring for Harper Collins right now. So it's a very timely question. Let's first segment that mentoring and coaching is separate, right? Coaching is a business for many people. Great for them. They have a uh, a pedagogy, they have an architecture, they have a format, they have a credential, a license, a shingle. They do yep. it for a business. And that's great. Everyone ought to probably hire a coach at some point in their life, how to sell better, how to communicate better, how to improve your platform skills. Most athletes I know have a coach. I have two speech coaches. I actually have a stutter. I'm a, I have a speech impediment. So I have a speech coach that helps me overcome that. And then there's mentoring. And mentoring is usually similar, but it has some differences. This is a person that is usually quite wise. They have a lot of experience in their career that they are doing this as a gift, have, a, have an abundance mentality. There's no cash being exchanged and usually has very strict boundaries, right? Here, what I will and will not do, how many sessions, how long they'll take and you have to respect people's time. But let me debunk the myth that you have to formalize your mentor. Yes, there are formal mentors. Jim, will you be my mentor for the next nine weeks every Friday from 4 to 4.45 to teach me how to grow my client base from X to Y? Yes, that's great. I won't ask for you to invest. I won't ask for your Rolodex. Very strict boundaries. That's a formal mentor. You usually find them inside your organization, but, but with post-pandemic, hopefully post, and in a virtual world, that's a little more difficult. So I would I would dispel the 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 default mindset that you have to formalize your mentor. There's a time and a place to do that. I encourage you to do that, but there's lots of informal mentors. Most of my mentors I've never met. They don't even know I'm alive. Here's a good example. I'm much older than you, Jim, but back in the seventies and eighties, there was a guy on talk radio called Bruce Williams. He was the Dave Ramsey when Dave Ramsey was in diapers and Bruce Williams really invented talk radio. He actually set up Sally, Jesse, Raphael, you know, the famous yeah, nice. person. She was, she was on radio long before TV. And between the time I was 12 years old and 25, I listened to Bruce Williams every night from 7 till 10 p.m. I was 12 years old listening about law and finances and credit scores and, and, and home equity loans and estate planning and how to, you know, how to buy a home. He never met me. 
but I learned more from Bruce Williams than anyone else in my life. Marcus Buckingham. I've never met Marcus Buckingham, right? I've read all his books and his work at Gallup and the Strengths Finder stuff. And it has had a profound influence on me to run with my strengths and not neglect, but kind of ignore my weaknesses. It's liberated me to do what I want to do. So I would remind your listeners and watchers today to don't box yourself into the mentor is the CFO in the fourth floor or the chief human resource officer in San Francisco, or it's only the mayor of my small town. It might be any and all of those, but it might also be someone whose books you read, whose podcasts you listen to, and you can really mainline their insight to teach you what to do, what not to do. Some of my mentors are people who've made the biggest mistakes in life. They have the most bankruptcies. They've made the biggest social faux pas. Their brands have imploded, and I've learned from them. They genuinely have mentored me whether they know it or not. I don't mean for that to be glib. Seth Godin was my mentor long before we ever became friends, and he endorsed my book and has coached me informally. I've probably learned as much from Seth before we became friends as since we did. Someone can't mentor you also unless you ask. So unless it's you know a mentor like I've described, if you want a formal mentor, reach out. Don't be afraid to say, hey, would you mentor me for three Fridays for a half an hour? Nothing more, nothing less. I promise to do my share of the work. I promise not to ask you to open your Rolodex or invest in me. And most people will say yes if they think you are serious about learning from them. So ultimately what we're talking about, and which I like, you're ultimately responsible for your own mentorship, right? And that's which we know, okay? Yeah. Um, you're ultimately responsible for taking control of it. You're not going to get it unless you request it. Uh, but the learning mindset, Yes. That so many people proclaim to to desire and try to en enhance a culture of learning. And we have to open our minds to be learners and everything else. That ultimately is what mentorship comes down to. And understanding what mentorship really is, it's ultimately a, a learning mindset is what you're talking about. Um, and so. where we learn can come from multiple people and you could formalize it or keep it informal. Mm -hmm including people that are you know, drastically different than you. I just interviewed Fred Reichel, the 40-year Bain fellow who invented NPS, and that promoter score. Uh, 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 Fred's a good friend of mine, you know, incomparable business intellect, right? 40-year Bain fellow, invented this, the customer service metric that basically every company in the world uses. I was interviewing, he was talking about how there were three companies that he was really fascinated with. Chick-fil-A, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, and what's the insurance company for military families? Um, USAA. USAA. And so we interviewed all the CEOs and founders, including Truett Cathy, who was the founder of Chick-fil-A, a man that he was not personally very um, fond of, because as you know, Truett Cathy was a quite conservative evangelical Christian that spent many years of his life diametrically opposing the LGBTQ plus community. Fred Reichelt has two adult gay children he, of course, loves very much. And he resisted, but he knew there was a lot to learn from Truett Cathy, who built an incomparable business in Chick-fil-A as not just a great business enterprise, but as a model of how to treat your employees, ironically, mm -hmm. as a model of how to treat unprecedented customer service. So Fred, who you know was not only insulted, offended, but probably quite abhorrent to a lot of Truett Cathy's ideas, went out and learned a ton from Truett Cathy. He put aside perhaps their personal you know, differences and realized I have so much to learn from this man. I can put aside my differences. And I think there's great value in taking what you said a step further. Perhaps you pick people on the opposite side of the aisle who you may find repulsive in their personal views, but you can find immense value in some of their business views or vice versa. There's so much to learn from people who often you even just vehemently disagree with. And, and that conversation is what, I mean, we could probably go real meta philosophical in, in terms of the needs to have these, these types of learning conversations. But what I like about you, and you, you talk about a little bit in the book, you take the learning mindset for your family to like a completely different level with your monthly dinner, which I like circled at the beginning and I love it. So tell us about the monthly dinner because I love the idea. I do. So my wife and I, as I mentioned, live in Salt Lake City and we're fairly well known now for these dinner sometimes or twice monthly where we invite 15 of our friends over from all walks of life they could be titans of industry they could be school teachers or you know people who are retired or on the upswing or on the down low for that matter 
not the down low. That's a different. That's a different term. <laughs> They're on the down down swing, right? Well, they could sneak it through the back door, I guess. They could, they so to speak, so to speak. So when we invite a celebrity over, right? Uh, uh, John Huntsman, the, the you know famed uh, ambassador to China, Russia, former governor, ran for president, came. Post Malone's coming in January. Ty Burrell from Modern Family is coming in. Dece- he's our December guest. And we invite us, uh, Nick Vujicic came as well. And so we invite a big celebrity. Uh, somehow we fly them in. They come over. We know them through our friends somehow. And we all sit down and have barbecue. This is not like a, you know, a five-star dinner. Sometimes it's nice. Sometimes it literally is pizza and barbecue. And we just sit around a table. And our three sons get to participate. Nice. And they get the presence of living in this adult world for a couple of hours and understanding what it's like to be sitting with the former ambassador to Russia or China or a person who, you know, ran for president or Nick Vujicic, who has no arms and no legs and they watch him being fed. They watch how he gets to the toilet. They watch how he gets in out of a car being carried everywhere. And so then we debrief these dinners the next day on what we learned. And I think it is instilling in our children an abundance mindset of a spirit of gratitude, how to be a gentleman, how to ask questions and how to listen, how to be in the presence of people with differing opinions. And so you're right. We very much have these dinners, not just for our friends, but also we're trying to raise three gentlemen in a world that is not full of gentlemen right now. And uh, I think that will become my biggest legacy. I don't love parenting. I got married when I was 41. We had three boys in five years. I never wanted to be a dad. My wife wanted to be a mom. So that was part of the deal. And so now I'm doing my best to make sure that that's my legacy in life is launching these three young men well into a world of uh, of un, un, unfathomable challenges that you and I did not face when we were growing up. Right. It's a completely different world. And it's, you know what, it's fun, but it's a, it's a huge work. <laughs> it, it, it's, well, it may be fun to you. Last night, there were three ba- basketballs bouncing, not in unison at 830 in my dining room as all the champagne glasses were, were you know, earthquaking. But they didn't fall, so that's good. It's a victory, right? Remember, that perspective. And if one up. did, what the hell, right? Uh, but I love that, you know, understanding comes from exposure, right? True. And and perspective comes from exposure. And and when you look at that scale from Nick to, you know, a, a John oh, Huntsman to a Post yeah. Malone yes. is really just, uh, that's fascinating. <laughs> um, and I'd be really interested to know what Post Malone eats. Uh, yes. when, well, when I'll let you know <laughs> and what his bodyguards eat too. As I hear that's right. That's big right. Bossy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we used to, I actually eat. hear he's a lovely person and quite generous. I think his philanthropy is not well known. I think he is an enormously generous human being. Yeah. I think it's, well, you know what? People misinterpret tattoos sometimes, <laughs> you know, but it's, um, yeah. but that's, I, I think Wait, that's does he have tattoos? Uh, I, have tattoos. So I hear, I've heard, I don't know. Um, so as, as we, Think about, so you've, you, you've made it real. We've talked about mentorship. How about you as a leader? Yeah. As you think about your teams, the mentorship for people, you know, I like to talk on this podcast. We we were at a a conference at Belfast and they said, we're all, um, we're all ancestors, Hmm. right? We think about the great grandparents we had and the work that they did and we referenced them and how they got us to where we are. Someone's going to talk about us in that particular way as well. How do you want people to think about you? How do you want people to think of you as a mentor? Do you give advice? Talk about, talk about you and um, how you position yourself as a leader to your team to get them to be better. So I'm drawing on three decades of leadership experience as a formal leader of people making lots of mistakes and a couple of successes along the way. I've written numerous books on leadership, including some Wall Street Journal bestseller books behind me. So what I share with you right now is three decades of work. First and foremost, a leader's job is to achieve results with and through other people, period. Your job is not to be the smartest person in the room, not to be the genius in the room, but to be the the igniter of other people's genius, to be the genius maker. And this requires the right kind of person in leadership because not everyone should be a leader of people. Just like not everyone should be a commercial airline pilot or an anesthesiologist. Not everyone should be a leader of people. But if you are, going to lead people, your mindset, your paradigm, your belief system has to be that your job is to achieve results with and through others. And that becomes your default mindset. You start to realize that my job is to coach. My job is to mentor. My job is to listen. My job is to build capability in others, to slow down, 
and develop relationships that my job is to give people feedback on their blind spots, to move outside my comfort zone and discuss the undiscussables, to sit people down and have perhaps life-changing conversations about their blind spots that are going to carry forward with them through their entire life. That You have the chance to be a transition figure in someone's life by calling them and saying, hey, Jim, I want to have a high courage conversation with you, but first I want to declare my intent. My intent is not to embarrass you, diminish you, or in any ways compromise your self-esteem or self-worth. My job is to give you some feedback on what I see are some blind spots in your behavior that are having a deleterious impact on your performance here. And if continued, might even result in your termination. I am on your side and I want to, you get the point, right? Is And then you talk about behaviors. This is the biggest gift you can give your people. This is mentoring in action. Is sitting someone down in the privacy of their or your office or going on a walk with a cup of coffee and saying, hey, I'd like to give you some feedback, which everyone always bristles. But first, declare your intent. My intent is to lift you up. My intent is to help you. My intent is to help you see what are some self-defeating behaviors. I'm focusing on this because this is the biggest gift you can give your people. Kim Scott wrote an amazing book. She is one of the master mentors called Radical Candor. Yep. It's an amazing story where Sheryl Sandberg, was her boss at Google and was a transition figure with her because the opposite of radical candor is ruinous empathy where you are a coward and you don't have the courage to move outside your comfort zone and discuss the undiscussables. I think that is the main job of a leader and a mentor is to help people see their blind spots and how to figure out how not to repeat them. And have one of those. I mean, when we talk about skill sets for, for, for the new economy, for leadership, the ability to have those conversations uh, from from us going into organizations. Most organizations don't teach their leaders how to have these kind We talk about radical candor. We talk about all these things, right. but right. how that's interpreted is generally yeah. um, generally not necessarily productive. You're exactly right because what happens is even when someone gets the concept of radical candor, they usually lie on one of two ends of a scale. They either have an abundance of courage or they have an abundance of diplomacy. And if you're like me, I have an abundance of courage. So, you know, I'll talk to anybody about anything. If I'm not careful, I'll verbally eviscerate you. So I have to be mindful of balancing my courage with consideration and diplomacy. Of course, the opposite of true. Some people who are conflict avoidant have an excess of diplomacy. So they actually obfuscate and they talk around the, be around the bush, to use an American term. And you leave scratching your head wondering, I'm not quite sure what they were saying. The best feedback is that, is that delicate balance of courage and diplomacy. Recognizing that, you know what, I'll tell you, the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would have do unto you. Hey, I told you, I'm a Catholic guy. I love the Bible. I love the golden rule. But I think it's bunk in most cases. Instead, practice the platinum rule. Treat others how they want to be treated, not how you want to be treated. Because I like I like it hard, fast, and clear. I, I you know, Say what's on your mind. You know, I will bruise hard and heal fast, but not everyone is that way. That's so right. As a leader, you have to take the time to love your people. Understand, do some people want it over Starbucks coffee? Do some want it on Zoom? Do some want it in real time? Do some want it in private? Do some want it later? Do some want it in an email that they can digest and go throw up and then come back to a Zoom call tomorrow and talk about it? The best feedback is given in the way the receiver needs to receive it, not in best, not best how you choose to give it. It's fantastic. And it's perfect advice for, for what everyone needs. Scott, as we're wrapping up, let's talk about um, let's talk about you. What could people do for you? What's coming besides buy the book, right? Master Mentors. Yeah. Talk about you, your business, what you're looking to do, and, and how people can get in touch with you. What you can do for me is go mentor someone. Go offer to mentor someone. Say, you know, I've got some expertise in this, and I see you on a similar path. You ever want to, you know, get together on some calls? I'd be happy to share my ideas. You can also uh, visit me at scottjeffreymiller.com. I write a column for Inc. Magazine every week. It's there. I write a blog for LinkedIn. All 200 episodes of the podcast are there. My episodes for Book Club are there. All the books I've written, you can follow me on every platform, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, including TikTok starting in January. And I'm delighted for the spotlight today. Thank you for the time today. 
Scott, thank you so much. So follow Scott. We got, uh, I'll put all of his info on bellwetherhub.com. Scott, this is fantastic. Everybody's looking for a mentor. Everybody's looking to get that edge. Everybody's trying to learn. And this is, Master Mentors is a good start. The two I highlighted, by the way, Susan David and Daniel Pink. Those are my Susan two Susan David, good stuff. Um, yeah. 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 And Susan, I don't think, I don't think in the coaching world, yeah. I don't think people, coaches fully appreciate the impact that Susan David has on all the language that comes out of coaches' mouths in terms of, you know, emotional agility and everything else. So and plus she's South African, so she's a joy to listen to. <laughs> totally, completely, absolutely. Um, so Scott, thank you so much. Uh, you get Master Mentors. Uh, it's it's worth the read. Um, put it by your bedside and and there's lots of, uh, lots of great nuggets. So thank you everybody to that. Um, oh, wait, we got a question. You wanna answer a real quick question? I'd love to. In the wake of the COVID pandemic, where most organizations have shifted to a virtual work setting, what adjustments have you made to your mentoring approach in order to ensure the uh, audience receives the same positive, impactful outcome? There's a long one. Let me undo this. Uh, yeah. Without face-to-face -face interaction. How do you mentor without face-to-face -face interaction in COVID when you're doing it virtually? Well, I think you're doing it virtually face-to-face. -face. I still think it's super important to be on Teams or Zoom or Skype or whatever it is you're on, Zencast or whatever, so that you can see the person's inflection. You can kind of get a feel for what it is they're trying to accomplish. You know, mentorship is mentorship requires you to resist the temptation of putting your skills and your fears on the other person. Not how I would do it. Let's talk about how you should do it. And I think it's vital to ensure that your mentoring still happens on camera like this, because so much of our communication, as you know, is nonverbal. And you can pick up so much on about a person's fears or their passions or whether or not you're connecting on a topic. So whether it's face-to-face -face in person or face-to-face -face like this, it's got to be on camera so that as a mentor, you really can connect with your mentee and not mistake your passions and your journey with theirs. It's perfect. And there's so much from communication and, and teaching that's beyond just the words. So the, right. the face and the body and everything, that's great. Um, so thank you, Dennis, for that question. Thank you, Eileen, for the comment. And everybody, thank you for listening. As always, I appreciate it. More on bellwetherhub.com. I'll give you all the info on, on Scott so that you can re reach out to him and tune into him and, and do all that good stuff. So Scott, thank you so much. My pleasure. I really appreciate the time today. And thank you, everybody, for listening. <laughs>